Uh, the talk I'm giving today is largely based on this paper that four of my colleagues wrote recently in which we looked at how uh, causal bias in your data can affect, how, can affect the fairness of the models that you make. Uh, before I get to the experiment, though, uh, I'd like to start with a question. And I don't really have an answer for all of you, for all of your models, uh, but I do have some questions to ask. So uh, the first question, even before what is fair, I suppose, is why do we care that our models are fair? Uh, machine learning models get used in a lot of places nowadays, and some of these places are very consequential. Uh, for example, most people don't have enough cash to buy a house just straight up, so they need to borrow money. And people that lend money want to make sure that they're lending money to people who can pay that money back. And so in order to make these decisions at scale very quickly, they turn to machine learning models. So those models, we want to make sure those models are fair, right? Uh, there are people who want to, who, who have the hope of taking human bias out of the criminal justice system using models. And so there's, there's a hope that maybe you can use models to predict uh, how likely somebody is to, to commit future crimes, uh, uh, and that uh, you can be simultaneously more fair and more accurate. And so these models are getting used all across the country today to make decisions about whether people go to jail and whether people get parole. So those models, we care about those models being fair, yeah? Um, Sometimes models are maybe a little more trivial. Sometimes your machine learning models are targeting advertisements at people. I, I would argue that even in cases of targeting ads for, for sandwiches or movies or things like that, that bias can be important. But sometimes ads are, sometimes advertisements are very consequential too. Uh, for example, you might have advertisements about jobs. And there have been studies about how machine learning targeting can, can be biased in showing people jobs, that sometimes high-income jobs and low-income jobs get preferentially shown to different subgroups of people. And that can have a big effect on people's lives, just knowing whether the opportunity is available or not. Uh, so maybe I've convinced you that your models should be fair, that you should be thinking about this. We still need to know how do we measure whether or not a model is fair. And uh, if you can, uh, so yeah, how do you measure whether or not your model is fair? And this, this may seem simple to you at first. Maybe you already realize that there's some subtleties. But uh, let me give you uh, one more concrete case study. study. So uh, this really came to prominence for me with this ProPublica article a couple of years ago. There's a, uh, an algorithm called Compass. Compass is used to predict recidivism, whether or not a, a prisoner or a, uh, somebody being charged with a crime will commit future crimes. So when a person is arrested, they'll enter their demographics and information about previous arrests, uh, where they live, things like that, into the system. The Compass algorithm will give them a risk score, rating how likely they are to commit a future crime. And the makers of Compass, as I understand it, intended this to be used in distributing scarce resources for rehabilitation. Uh, but in practice, a lot of judges were using this for, for more than that. They were using this to determine, for example, whether people would even get bail or whether they would just be kept in jail. And so that, we care about fairness there. ProPublica did a comprehensive examination. Uh, there's actually a notebook online with the results of their analysis that you can look up. But they found that analyzing the scores given by Compass to defendants and comparing that to whether or not these people had committed crimes after being released from jail, they found that Compass was biased. For, uh, for white defendants, the uh, algorithm was much more likely to incorrectly say that they would not commit a future crime. And for African American defendants, the algorithm was much more likely to say that they would incorrectly say they would commit a future crime. So, too many more false negatives for white defendants, more false positives for black defendants. And again, false positive here means that these people might be denied bail. Something that I found really interesting when I started digging into this more is that uh, North Point, the makers of the Compass algorithm, in 2009, they published a paper studying the, the fairness of the Compass algorithm. 
And they were actually more concerned about gender bias here. It turns out that there's significant differences in recidivism behavior between men and women, and it's difficult for algorithms to get that right. So they were very interested in, in showing that their algorithm was correctly accounting for gender differences. And they, they argued that their algorithm was, in fact, predicting well for both men and women. But they also looked at race. And the row that I've highlighted here is, is showing you the AUCs of the models on white and African American defendants. And North Point says, uh, looked at their algorithm, algorithm and said it was equally good for both races, and so everything's great. ProPublica article actually acknowledges this as well. They, they checked the accuracy of the algorithm, and they found that overall accuracy was the same between races, no difference. And, and yet, ProPublica argues, and I would tend to agree with them, that the false positive and false negative rates are actually a bit more consequential here. So this is, I think, an interesting case. The, the makers of this algorithm cared about bias, and they checked for bias, and they concluded there wasn't any bias. And yet someone else coming by later did another check, looked at it in a different way, and said, this actually is very biased, and this is a problem. So there are some subtleties going on with determining whether or not your algorithms are fair. Uh, where does bias come from? So you're training your models on data. Where does the data come from? What makes up the data? <clears throat> and you have to look at whether the data are balanced or imbalanced and potential sources of bias in the data. Uh, for example, there's different ways the data could be biased or balanced or imbalanced. And the first thing to consider is that maybe reality just is not different between your protected classes. For example, breast cancer. The rates of breast cancer are extremely different between men and women. Going, looking at it the other way, the rates of prostate cancer are extremely different between men and women. And if you're making a classifier for this, uh, one metric that people often use to measure fairness of models uh, is called disparate impact. As far as I know, disparate impact is the only metric that actually shows up in United States case law. It's been used to argue on a, in a legal framework that that algorithms are illegally biased. But if you look at disparate impact, it's comparing the rates of positive predictions for each of the protected classes, and it's asserting that these rates should be the same. If you're making a classifier for something like breast cancer or prostate cancer, then if your classifier actually passes this test, I would argue it's doing a very bad job. So even if your data are balanced, so reality is completely uh, indifference to your protected classes. You're, you never are privileged to train on all of the data perfectly sampled. You're always taking subsamples, biased samples. Maybe you look at, uh, at proxies for the thing you actually care about. One way that you can get bias into your training data, even if, the tra even if ground truth is balanced, is through what's called label bias. With label bias, your, your labels for the classes have causal influence from your protected classes. Uh, as a concrete example, there's a study looking at how teachers rated kindergartners' problem behavior. And they showed that the teachers actually, actually had different thresholds for suspending children based on race. The same problem behavior was much more likely to get a child suspended if that child were African American or Hispanic. And, and so if you were making a classifier for predicting whether or not kindergartners were going to have problems and might need extra help, if you use whether or not the child had been suspended previously as your label, then you're introducing bias into your training set. So even if the labels are good, you might get, uh, you might get bias through what's called sample bias. With sample bias, you are preferentially including or not including individuals in your sample at all based on their protected class. Concrete example would be stop and frisk policies. So stop and frisk is a policy whereby police officers can stop individuals on the street and check them for illegal firearms, drugs, anything they're, they're not supposed to be carrying. And there's been some evidence that, at least in some cases, police officers have different thresholds of suspicion for stopping persons of different races. So even if the police officers are equally good at checking all of these individuals for contraband, equally likely to find contraband on everyone, just the fact that the process of including them in the data set at all is biased can now introduce that bias into your model's training set. 
Uh, another fairness metric that you might look at is what's called equal opportunity. So in equal opportunity, you're looking at the rate of true positives for each of your protected classes, and you're asserting that the rate of true positives should be the same. So this sounds great, but if your data set has this kind of causal bias in it, label bias or sample bias, then asserting that you should have the same rate of true positives, you might actually be creating a biased model. And finally, you want to think about what it is that your model is doing. If your model is sending people to jail, then maybe it's worse to have false positives than to have false negatives. If your model is handing out money for loans, then maybe it's worse to have false negatives than to have false positives. There's not, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution for this. You've got to think about what it is that you're building the model to do. I think when models first started being used in, at scale in the public, people had this idea that models are math, and math doesn't care who you are, it doesn't care about protected classes. So if, as long as we use models to make our predictions, then everything will be fair, we're all good. We're taking bias out of the process. I, I think that now people have come to the realization that this isn't the case, and hopefully I've given you a little bit of evidence how that might not be the case. But there's, there's now a push to try to fix this in, in ways. And you can fix this by trying to look at different uh, metrics for predicting fairness. You can try to fix this by modifying the training process of your model. And if you can encode your ethics into your loss function, which can be possible in certain cases, then you can enforce fairness in your models. But you still have the same issues in, in adding constraints to your models. So it's not. It's not the case that you can add it, pick one constraint off the shelf, add that in, everything's automatically taken care of. Uh, all right, so on to experimentation. So in, uh, we took a data set from some of Civis's consulting work, and we wanted to see how easy it would be to predict bias in this data set using some of the metrics from the literature. And the data set that we used, the features are uh, demographics on individuals, and the outcome is the modeled probability that an individual will sign up or not sign up for a particular service. And in this data set, the bias that we're looking at is racial. So some of the individuals in the data set, about uh, 10,000 individuals are labeled as being African American. 120,000 individuals in this data set were labeled as being white. And from the original data set, we will run two different experiments. In one experiment, we artificially make uh, we artificially balance the data set. So we'll select out only the 120,000 individuals who had been labeled as white. We'll remove the race label and randomly re reassign either an African American or white label. Uh, for the second one, we'll keep the original data set, which contains imbalance, different numbers of uh, individuals labeled as being different races. The individuals labeled as African American had a, uh, with a 0.5 threshold, I think they had a 10% 10% of them signed up for the service, and 50% of individuals labeled as white signed up for the service, so that there's imbalance in that data set. Now, we take these two different experiments, and each experiment will introduce known levels of bias. To introduce known label bias, we'll uh, take those model probabilities, which we're now assuming to be ground truth, and we will threshold them differently based on race. So we'll make it... Uh, will we'll make it easier for the label to be uh, positive if the race is white, harder if the race is labeled as African American. And for unbiased data, we'll just set that threshold at 0.5 for everyone. To introduce known sample bias, we will uh, sample people differently based on race. So make it easier, if, if your race is labeled as white, we'll make it easier to include you in the data set if your score is high, harder if your score is low. Uh, so for the first case, uh, label bias, that's like the, the kindergartner problem. So your label is going to be, you have different thresholds for assigning per people to label. For this case, the sample bias, this is like a bias stop and frisk policy, where your, your label could be fair, but your likelihood of being in the data set at all depends on, on uh, your likelihood, D depends on the probability of what your label is. So now two different experiments. We have four data sets for each, one data set with no causal bias at all, one data set with only causal label bias, one data set with only causal sample bias, and one data set with both causal label and causal sample bias. 
For each of these four data sets, we'll tr we train a logistic regress regression classifier on the data and make predictions. And now we'll run each of those, we'll run all those predictions through our fairness metrics. In the paper, we consider six different fairness metrics. But uh, for, this, for the purposes of this talk, I've selected out four of them. Uh, hard to fit more on the slides, and it gets pretty complicated in the plots. But uh, for these four, I mentioned already disparate impact, which compares overall rates of positive predictions, and equal opportunity, which com compares probabilities of true positives for each of the protected classes. There's also equal misopportunity, which looks at rates of false positives, so this is something that you might care about if you're making a recidivism algorithm, for example. And then there's difference in average residuals, where you take the model prediction, the predicted probability, and compare that to the label. And for disparate impact, uh, a, a value of one is fair, and for the other three, values of zero are fair. fair. Uh, so with the balanced ground truth, where we've artificially made sure that everything is, is uh, equal, then all of these metrics detect bias. Some of them detect bias a little better than others in different cases. Uh, interestingly, the difference in residuals is doing better on label bias than sample bias. Uh, not quite sure why that would be. Um, the, the situation is a bit different for the uh, imbalanced data set. With the imbalanced data set, the good news is that all of these metrics are still detecting bias. Uh, the bad news is that they're still detecting bias even in the, the uh, unbiased ground truth, which is imbalanced. In fact, it's particularly different, difficult to tell the difference between the case of no bias and the case of sample bias, uh, sorry, label bias. Uh, and remember, when you're looking at, these al looking at these metrics in practice, you don't actually know what the number would be, what, what these metrics would be telling you if your data set were unbiased. So when you're looking at this, uh, one thing to remember is that it's not actually, you don't know for sure if the metric is telling you that your, your model is biased. You don't know for sure where the problem is. It could be that, that your reality, the thing that you're trying to predict, really is imbalanced and that the predictions are reflecting that. It could be that your training set had introduced bias into the training process and that your model is now being biased. Uh, maybe this is obvious for some of you that biased uh, imbalanced data will look like bias, but I think it's, it's worth emphasizing that uh, there's no, no trivial answers to these problems. So what can you do about this kind of thing? I'm not saying don't use fairness metrics. There's a lot of different metrics in the literature, a lot of different things to think about. Uh, I didn't even touch on, for example, calibration, which is making sure that your probabilities are are good probabilities, well-calibrated probabilities, regardless of the protected class membership. That might be a thing you care about, but that alone certainly won't guarantee that your models are fair. Uh, you have to consider what it is that your model is doing, as I said, whether you're, you're doing good things or bad things to people. If you do know what you're doing, uh, if you do know, know what your model doing, is doing, uh, consider the social context. You can potentially enforce fairness in your model by using one of many different techniques from the literature. Uh, there's actually, so these papers that I've cited here are good papers and worth reading. I, I show them mostly to convince you that there is a wide literature. There's a lot of work being done on this topic that you should look at if your models, if you care about enforcing fairness in your models. Uh, importantly, you should make sure that people from different backgrounds are involved in creating your models. People with different backgrounds will be able to uh, think of different potential problems in your data and different ways that your models could affect the world, could affect the people that you're making predictions about. And don't skip your, uh, your exploratory data analysis and remember to look at what the predictions that your model is making and try to think about it from as many different angles as possible. So this is, this is a place where your uh, diverse team is really going to come in handy, thinking about different impacts that your model might have. So when you're, when you're writing programs, your computer programs are going to, your computer is going to do exactly what your program tells it to do, no more and no less, right? I think machine learning is similar in that 
your, if you have a training data set and you're doing a good job training, uh, training your model on this data set, then the model is going to reproduce the statistical distributions in your data set when it's making predictions. It's going to learn the data that you give it. It's not going to learn the data that you wish you had or the data that the world should have. And so you need to think about what predictions you're making. Is, is, is your data, are your data the truth? And if your data are the truth, are your data the truth that you want to have in the world? Uh, your models are going to affect the world. If, if people aren't making decisions based on your models, then, then why are you bothering to make these models in the first place? So people are going to make decisions, and these decisions are going to change the world. So you should think about how, your, how these decisions are changing the world and whether it's the kind of change that you think is, is worth making. So thank you. Questions? Have people looked into whether increasing the model complexity in terms of bringing in data from further afield that's not necessarily obviously correlated to the specific outcome, but maybe related to the demographics? would potentially increase that fairness or maybe introduce an element of information that will affect the outcome? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. I, so one way of trying to ensure fairness is to try to make sure that there's no information about the protected classes in the data. It sounds like that might be a little bit of what you're touching on. So more, more, including more information to maybe try to drown out the impact of the protected class. And yeah, uh, so that's, I think it, again, it depends on what your model is trying to do and what you're, you want your model to do because there are inequalities in the world and it can be that making the best predictions possible, making the best, best predictions possible will often reinforce the status quo. And it can potentially perpetuate inequalities that exist already. Uh, like maybe if you're looking at, at loan predictions, loan, uh, loan risks, then certain people are going, to be, are going to have defaulted on loans at higher rates in the past but that might be because of circumstances beyond their control. And if you don't give them those loans, it'll be harder for them to get out of poverty and get themselves to a position where they will be able to repay loans at higher rates in the future, just for example. So including more data and making better models is definitely a good thing to do, but it's not necessarily going to make your models fair. Any other questions? Uh, so in uh, government and uh, other sectors, they have uh, uh, sunshine laws where you can, you know, get into government records and you can actually find out, like, what is going on. So do you see something like that for these models that are having these outside, in these outsized impacts on people's lives, like some kind of sunshine sunshine law where they can get into these models and run other kind of uh, experiments like ProPublica did? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great idea because like the ProPublica example, if they hadn't been able to run that experiment, if they hadn't had the data on like, the predictions that the Compass algorithm had been giving in the first place, then we never would have known that that algorithm was making those, those biased decisions. So I, I definitely think that where algorithms are making these important predictions, that it should be much easier for outside organizations to check whether those algorithms are biased or not. There's, there's definitely resistance to that because a lot of these algorithms are regarded as proprietary and the makers of these algorithms don't want to give up their trade secrets. So there, there's resistance, but uh, certainly for, for things like, like recidivism, I think it's important to be able to look at that. And you can go beyond that potentially by by instead of looking at these things in bulk, having, trying to require that algorithms uh, 
are more interpretable, that you get information about why algorithms are making certain predictions. And that can help give the humans looking at those predictions some idea of, why, of whether or not those predictions might be biased or not. So adding more interpretability to models can, can I think, help improve fairness, as long as people are looking at those and thinking about them. Hello. Um, I just have a question. So if you're building a model that is prioritizing or optimizing for precision, and you have a highly imbalanced data set, what are some sampling techniques that you recommend for that? Uh, uh, so how do you train a model in a very imbalanced data set? Uh, there's, yeah, there, that's kind of a separate literature, training models on imbalanced data. Uh, one thing that you can do is trying to, uh, to resample the data so that you get more examples of the, the rare class, so that the model better learns those distributions. Um, that could potentially also be something that you can do in a fairness context, trying to change the distributions within different classes to, to better balance your training data. Again, that depends on social context and what your model is trying to do. Uh, I know there's various, various tools that are built especially for training on imbalanced data, so I'd recommend looking at some of those. Thanks for the great talk. Um, just wondering, do your, can your fairness metrics be applied when the protected class isn't actually included in the model? So for example, if you're building a credit model and you don't want to include gender as a, as a feature. And then also, second part, um, are there Python implementations for these um, fairness metrics too that we can use? Uh, yeah, so for a lot of these, for, for these fairness metrics, you have to know the label of the protected class, otherwise you really can't check. But uh, you, can, you can certainly do that whether or not the protected class is included in the training data or not. And often it's a good idea to not include the protected class in the training data. Although I, I will say that um, in, in some of these techniques for enforcing fairness in your data, you have to do that by including the protected class label. If you know that label and you want to enforce certain distributions in the, the outcome probabilities, then you can do that. Uh, for uh, for specific packages that do these. I don't have names off the top of my head, but a lot of these are really easy to implement yourself if you look up the, the particular metric. For uh, comparing true positive and false positive rates, for example. Uh, a lot of these, you can just get out of scikit-learn and evaluate the metrics on different protected classes and compare them. Just, just regarding the first question, I guess it's, um, yeah, if the, if the feature maybe is included, but if other features correlate, then maybe signal might get into the model directly. So if certain correlates with gender that's in the model, um, would, the, would, the, would the fairness metrics maybe pick up that? Yeah, the, the fairness metrics won't tell you influence of particular features, but they're looking at the outcomes and whether the outcomes are, are balanced or fair between protected classes. Thank you. But yeah, that's definitely the case that often uh, features that you might not even think of as being correlated with, with protected class are sometimes very correlated with protected class. So this statement, putting fairness ahead of profit, that may be a tough pill to swallow for some, for many, right? Do you think at a certain point maybe policy may be a way to move things forward, things similar to GDPR or something like that? Yeah, I, I think that there's, there's so many subtleties involved in this that it's hard for me to see how you could craft a good, good regulation around saying that models have to be one way or another. And the, the thing that I highlighted with disparate impact is, is an example of that, that there's examples in American case law where a disparate impact metric of less than 0.8 represents unfair bias in your model, but sometimes that's not necessarily a bad thing, like with the cancer classifier. I, I think that GDPR is maybe pointing at a better way to take this, which goes back to the, the earlier question about transparency. And 
if the regulations are not necessarily around enforcing a particular outcome or a particular metric on models, but if, the, if there's regulations around enforcing either transparency in predictions, availability to public scrutiny, or in model interpretability, that's probably a better direction to take regulations. Just adding on to that last statement, is there any type of uh, push to combine um, for-profit data with non-profit data? I mean, credit institutions may have biased against blacks and Hispanics for loans, but you know, giving microloans to other countries with the same you know, minorities has a different set of rules. Is there any thoughts around combining you know, different data sets to, to create more fairness overall with models? Uh, that's, that's an interesting idea. I don't think I've come across that before, and I'd like to talk to you after this uh, about that in more detail. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, please give you a little round of applause.